Well, good morning. Uh, we're going to begin with a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are so thankful for your word, for the opportunity we have to study together, and we invite your Holy Spirit to work upon our hearts and minds. We know, Lord, that um, we are frail human beings, that we are fraught with error, and that there is little that we understand. But we know, Lord, that you are shining light upon our path, and we just pray that the examination of that light this morning may bear fruit and that it may guide us on our course. Be with each person in the struggles that they have and help us to trust fully in thee. Be with us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, good morning. So we had a little bit of a discussion about this. So we're going to have to – I'll go through what I'm thinking about our study. So – so on Thursday, we, we finished off with this, a bit of a discussion about the numbering of the tribes. And then this is this passage here in Judges chapter 5. In the Song of Deborah, we have uh, these doublings, the captivity captive, the awake, awake twice, and this uttering of a song. And I had noticed that some of this language um, has has implications in in mathematics now um where was this here don't want to go too far back um okay so i think probably we would start at at 512 now um Dwight, you can keep your visual on if, if uh, because when you're when you speak, then people will be able to see you. It'll switch between us. Okay. So, because um, we're gonna we have a little bit of a discussion. You have some things that you have to share that we already shared before the study, but we want to go through those again. Um, so anyway, what we have here in Judges five twelve is this awake awake. Now, what does it mean to awake? What's what's the Hebrew word? I, I don't know if you can see that. But it's the word ur, which means to open up the eye, eyes. That's the idea. Right? So we are, are being told to open up our eyes. And why would we need to open up our eyes? Because we've been asleep. Okay. We've been asleep. Now, Deborah represents what? What have we understood? De I mean, we know it means a bee, whatever that means. Um, whether Deborah is just a bee in the bonnet, I don't know. But um, what is Deborah symbolizing here? I believe our conversation was that Deborah was symbolizing the spirit of prophecy. Okay. So it symbolizes the spirit of prophecy. And um, and then it says here, utter a song. Now, the word utter is just the word debar, which means speak. It's used all, all, all the time in the Bible. Um, uh, but it, it does mean one of the things it means is, um, what was this here? I mean, I'm just going to read the whole thing. Uh, a primitive root, perhaps properly to arrange. So we're being asked to open up our eyes and arrange something. And then we have a song. And uh, the idea of a song, I'm just going to go over here, um, comes from uh, the word sheer, which means to sing. Um, and the idea of a strolling uh, minstre minstrel minstrelsy. Okay, but are we are we applying that in the masculine or the feminine? Um, what the word song? The word, yeah, the word song, which can be sheer or shira. 
Right. So here, I can just look at the Hebrew quickly. Um, oops. Uh, it's just sheer here. So it's the masculine form. So what does that mean that Barak is being told to utter a song? Or is Deborah being told to utter the song? Okay, so that's a good question. Who, who is being told to utter a song? So, um, so we're, re we're rehearsing the righteous acts. So we're going to take this as the lines and the way marks. And this is where we go down to the gates, right? So the preceding uh, verses there. And so then we're going to have this awake, awake. So this is the midnight cry. And uh, I mean, it would be seem to me that Deborah is the one that's being directed, awake, awake, Deborah, awake, awake, utter a song, right? Okay. So she's being told to utter a song. So this, we're saying Deborah represents the spirit of prophecy, but not Ellen White, right? Well, your comment, your, your comment on Thursday was that we should not be applying it to a person. Right. So if we're going to have this, that the spirit of prophecy needs to awaken, is it that it, the spirit of prophecy should awaken or that the people that are to use the spirit of prophecy are to awaken? Well, I would think, I would think both. That is, the spirit of prophecy is awakening in God's people, if we could put it that way. And then we are told to basically organize or arrange a song. Right? A recounting of events. Yeah, so, and, and, and this idea of arranging, the idea of arranging and ordering a song, I mean, this has to do with the events, but in this context, dealing with the error that's here, this would be addressing chronology. Right? So, I mean, this is, so what I see here is that we have, um, the application that we are making is that we are to make a calculation of some sort. We need to organize or order or arrange uh, this information so that we can understand it. Now, we also have Arise Barak. So we take Barak as the message of chronology, right? All right. And the one of the words, the root or the word that's kum, which means uh, to lift up, can also mean to confirm. And, and that's one of the things we see in the characteristics of what we've done with chronology. That is, we haven't created anything by chronology. Chronology and dates have just confirmed what we have established in other ways of studying. Would we agree with that? I won't disagree with it. Neither will I. Yeah, because to me, that's like we haven't created new doctrines or, or created new theology. No. All we have done is we have taken the light that has come from the study of God's word and the spirit of prophecy. And we've been able to confirm things by an analysis using the same analysis that I used in the Old Testament and the New Testament regarding the prophetic periods. And then we made a prediction, you know, July 18, 2020, based upon that same type of analysis, but with, with an unclear, uh, you know, we were unclear about what that would mean, you know, setting a date in the future. And, and now we can see that we can't predict events, but we still need to use this analytical tool and in understanding what has happened in this movement. And so we're taking this, you know, God has many different layers in which his word exists. 
and we're not saying that this is all we would use Judges 5 for, but it does apply, as we can see, to what has happened in this movement regarding Parminder's error and the time setting error. And so here, um, in order to address this time setting of Parminder, we're told to examine with our eyes, to wake up, to see, behold, to arrange things in a song, which obviously has to be symbolic. It means there's a mathematical aspect of music that is being applied here. And, um, and then, so Deborah is supposed to utter this song and then uh, sing to Barak, right? So Barak, and, and they're supposed to lead thy captivity captive. So captivity is supposed to be taken captive. Thou son of Abinoam, right? So we have, um, and we've looked at this, I can't remember the gematria on this, but um, we can see that this applies to what we've been doing with chronology. And then we have the next verse says, he, uh, then he made him that remaineth. Now we would look at this word as a remnant, but also a remainder. Right. And then Angela just refers us to the Zimri Parminder, the musician at Baal Peor. So in the um, in the rebellion of Baal Peor, <coughs> we have Zimri, which uh, refers to music. And um, so there is a true song and there's a counterfeit song. There's one that's in rebellion to God. And that was that there was a time prophecy. There's a way of setting time that Parminder was using that was in error. And But God has used the fact that Parminder brought in time into this movement, and God set up a counter to that. And that was a correct understanding of chronology, an analysis, an analytical tool that we could use that had been used in the past to establish prophetic periods and the 2520 in this movement. And this this was what countered what Parminder was doing, that showed what he was doing was error. Yes, and that's why Psalm 39, three through five is in the chat, because this is the, this is the right chronology that David was praying for. I think it was David that wrote that Psalm, wasn't it? Yeah, so, um, yeah, so we have- yeah, my heart was hot within me while I was musing, the fire burned, then spake I with my tongue, Lord, make me know mine end and the measure of my days, what it is that I may know how frail I am. Behold, thou hast made my days as the handbreadth, and mine age is as nothing before thee. And, and this is the thing that the true understanding of, of chronology, or even God's word, is supposed to bring us to an experience of dependence upon God, right? It's not to exalt self. So all of this, you know, needs to be seen in its proper light. Now, even the captivity captive, this reference, I mean, one of the main things that my work had revolved on was the understanding of the the Babylonian captivity, both in its origins coming from Leviticus 26 and also in Daniel's application of the time prophecies that end uh, these periods from Leviticus 26 and commence the period of the 70 weeks and the 2300 days. So the whole structure of the 2520 is tied up in this captivity. So this captivity being made captive I, I think is is an important point in understanding where this chronology comes from or where it it originates. And then we have in verse 13, him that remaineth. So remaineth is the idea of a remnant, but it also is a mathematical term. When we do a calculation and we have a remainder. So it, I don't know what it means. Then he that that remaineth have dominion over the nobles among the people. Um, it's particularly how we would apply that. Um, like 
especially even historically. So that's one of the problems here is when you have this the song of Deborah and Barak. Um, you know, how do we even understand? Then he made him that remaineth have dominion over the nobles among the people. How is that fulfilled historically? The Lord made me have dominion over the mighty. So who is the one that remains? Who are the mighty that remain? Well, no, he made this me, whoever is speaking, have dominion over the mighty. But he made him that remaineth have dominion over the nobles among the people. And then you can see that the one that remains here is me, and he has dominion over the mighty. Right? In the context here, how is this how is this referring to? Is this referring to Deborah or Barak? I think this would be Deborah. So because she's yeah. going to be the judge in this case. Yeah, I don't see it being Barak. Yeah. Okay. So and the nobles among the people. Well, or among the tribes. Okay, so the, the question that I would have to ask, mm -hmm. is there an application here with Ezekiel 17.24? Okay, can you read Ezekiel 17.24? And all the trees of the field shall know that I, the Lord, have brought down the high tree, have exalted the low tree, have dried up the green tree, and have made the dry tree to flourish. I, the Lord, have spoken and have done it. Okay. And you would make the application in what way? Well, when we're looking at this with 513. Yeah. Then he made him that remaineth have dominion over the nobles among the people. The Lord made me have dominion over the mighty. So is the he referring to the Lord and the him, the remnant of the people for this time? Okay, yeah, because there's a parallelism here. Yeah, so the him would refer to the Lord. Um, is the him referring to the Lord, or is the he referring to the Lord? Yeah, the he is referring to the Lord, pardon me. Thank you. And, and the him that remaineth, I mean, can't be Deborah, even though she says, me have dominion. So, so there's a parallel between those that remain and this symbol of the spirit of prophecy that has dominion over the mighty. Now, does the this... Does this parallelism also extend to Revelation 2, 26 and 27? Well, Revelation 2, that's going to be... Uh, okay, he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my father. Hmm. So, I mean, this is the, during the church of Thyatira. Right. Um, and so these are going to be the group of Protestants at the end. Uh, going up to the time of the end, right? Right. August is going to mark the time of the end. Um, I don't know. I'm not sure if we would make that application there, but, I mean, there's a parallel idea. Um. Okay, so so whatever this means here, this would mean to some degree uh, we can see the mathematical aspect here, 
right? So then it says in verse 14, out of Ephraim, there was a root of them against Amalek. Now, when we go to Judges chapter 4, it doesn't talk about Ephraim. Because we just have um, Zebulun and Naphtal Naphtali, 10,000. But here, it says that there was some out of Ephraim. There was a root against Amalek. After thee... Benjamin among thy people, and out of Macher, which is a reference to the um, the children of Manasseh on the west side of the Jordan, came down governors, and out of Zebulun they that handled the pen of the writer. Right, so this Zebulun and this pen of the writer, we understood that this is referring to. Um, uh, counting or enumeration. So can we take this as a calculation of some sort? Like if we were going to say out of Ephraim, there was a root. Is this referring to like a square root? If we sit, take a square root out of Ephraim, if we're taking an amount of Ephraim, subtracting the square root, from Ephraim itself as a tribe number. So you, you see where I'm getting at. And even the word Benjamin means let, um, son of the right hand, which um, can refer to, and, and we also know that uh, Ephraim being one of the sons of Joseph means him add. So you got these, these ideas, like we count on, on, on the hand, we can count numbers. So I, I don't know. I mean, I've, I've looked at this to figure out, is this telling us that we should do some kind of calculation? And how would we do that calculation? Well, does this take us back to what we, were, we talked about a while ago about the 10,000? Well, yes. So... So we know that the 10,000 can refer to a period of time. And where did we apply the 10,000 as a period of time? Anybody remember? I don't recall. I kept looking at the 10,000 having to deal with the 10,000 shekels and the 10,000 talents. Yeah, where I was just looking at is a number of days. Um, Ten thousand eighty is the number of increments in a Hebrew day. Right. It's not ten eighty, but it's it's close. That's the only note I have on ten thousand is ten thousand eighty. Okay. So I have to be with Dwight. No, I don't. I, I don't have a clue. <laughs> okay. Do you remember, Iran, where we applied the ten thousand? I'm not sure, but I thought it might go to March twenty-seven somewhere. Yeah, it went to March twenty-seven. Um, and I think it was twenty seventeen, right? So if we go to March 27, 2017, and I subtract, I'm just doing this here. What was that date again? Okay, so if we start on November 9th, 1989, which is the time of the end, and we count 10,000 days, it's going to bring us to March 27th, 2017. And it brings us into, the, into this structure of the 777 chiasm. And the original March 27th that we had was 2019. And then we had one for 2020 and one for 2021. So we had three March 27ths. But this would be two years prior to the one that's the center of that uh, between uh, August, not October 13th, 2018 and September 7th, 
2019. Right, so some people may not be familiar with that structure. But this is three days after the 777 days from my 15th birthday, which go to March 24th, and you had three days, goes to March 27th. And so that's 780 days, and 780 days is how many hours? It's 18,720 hours. Right. Okay. So to me, that was where I would make that application because it's going to be part of that structure of the 777 chiasm. So people would need to be familiar with that structure. Here, I'll just go and share that here. So I'll stop the share, give a new share. So this is just some of my charts. I have to get to that place, though. Um, I don't know if that will bring me to it or not. That 777, it starts in November 9th, right? 2017. That's that's the one period of 777 days. So when we deal with the whole structure, uh, so what you're going to have here, if you're looking at this, this is um, uh, this is not the whole thing, but we have the end of the Mayan calendar, right? That that thirteenth Bactun, which is one million eight hundred and seventy-two thousand days, and then we have seven hundred and seventy-seven days from that is my birthday, when I turned uh, fifty-two. But if I count from my birthday eighteen thousand seven hundred and twenty days, it would bring me two hundred and seventy-three days before my birthday. So if you look at this 777 days, it's divided as 504 and 273 days, just as we have from November 9th. If we go to um, this, so this is not the right diagram. I'm going to go back to wherever I put that diagram here. I'm going to find another one. Here we go to December 25th, 2021, wouldn't it? Yeah, uh, no, here it is. Yeah, November 9th to December 25th, 2021. What we don't have here is the July 18th date. July 18th is, or, or actually the March 27th date. So the March 27th date from November 9th, 2019 to March 27th, 2021 is 504 days. And then there's 273 days remaining. So if we count 777 days from my bir my 52nd birthday, it brings us to March 23rd, 2017. So, so it's not three. So why is that March 23rd? It should be March 24th. There we go. That's that's wrong. Okay, because I know it's March 24th. So March 24th, 2017 is the 25th day of the 12th month. And then you're going to have three more days um, to March 27th, which is going to be 780 days. I don't have it drawn in here. Um, but that's going to be the 10,000 days from November 9th, 1989. So it's going to fit in with this structure. So I need to draw this out. Um, then we also have another period of 777 days from September 23rd to November 9th. And then the first period that we recognized of 777 days. Though there is a period of 777 days from November 9th, 1989 to December 25th. 1991. So really, we have five periods of 777 days if we want to look at it that way. Uh, the point being here that we have this 10,000. So that's kind of um, and the, and what's the point of the 10,000 then? Wh why why is that important? Why are we mentioning this here? Because we have Zebulun that and and Naphtali, there's ten thousand out of those two tribes. Correct. Okay. And they're going to mention Zebulun here, and out of Zebulun, they that handle the pen of the writer. So when we look at this in the Hebrew, um, uh, the word handle means to draw. Um, 
so it's used in a lot of great variety of applications to sew to sound to prolong to develop to march to remove to delay um, defer extend forbear handle make sew scatter stretch out and um, that's the word mashak and then we have the word pin and the word pin um, uh, a stick for writing, fighting, ruling, walking, etc. So a dart, dart, uh, a scepter, a staff, a tribe, right? So we're dealing with these tribes. And then the writer, the word writer means uh, to properly to score with a mark as a tally or record, that is by implication to inscribe, also to enumerate, right? So to number things. And so that's one of the things that we are doing here is we're looking at these tribes and we're we're looking at the counting of these tribes and we're trying to understand them. We're trying to order them, stretch them out, uh, put some kind of sense to these. And then we're going to have the princes of Issachar uh, were with Deborah. So even Issachar and also Barak, he was sent on foot into the valley for the divisions of Reuben, there was great thoughts of heart. So what this is actually referring to in, in the events, it's not mentioned, it's just here in the song. So, so we have the princes of Issachar. So we have another tribe mentioned, Issachar. Um, so and maybe, maybe we're moving too fast here as we're going through this, but... Uh, and we got Psalm 45, verse 1, whatever that is. So what's Psalm 45, verse 1? It says, uh, my heart is indicting a good matter. I speak of the things which I have made, touching the king. My tongue is the pen of a ready writer. Okay. Um, I find out something interesting about Issachar. Okay. Uh, um, I was looking from the Great Disappointment, October 22nd, 1844. Okay. It's, uh, there's a 6,400 days, 6,000, it was 60,000 it's the numbers uh, 25, I think, 26. or 26. Numbers yes, 26, there's 25. There's a number there. I can't remember. I think 64, it's 60. 64,300. Yes. So if you go from there, it will take you to November 7, 2020. So that's from October 22nd, 1844. It takes you to November the 7th, uh, 2020. Okay, that's an inclusive count, which is a Sabbath. Yeah, so that was the date that Joe Biden was declared the winner of the presidential race. Okay, I remember that, yeah. So uh, one other thing I noted, that Isaacar is the fifth son of uh, Leah, and um, if you compare them to the, her sons, to Daniel 11, verse 2, you have the fourth, which is Trump. He's a far richer than them all. So uh, he would be represented by Judah. And then, so Biden then would be Issachar. He would be the fifth that follows Trump. So that would be in maybe another connection. Okay, so explain this. Why? What? How are you do? What are you doing with Trump? So we have Issachar. Trump's going to be. Yes. Yeah. So Daniel eleven verse two mentions three shall stand up, and the fourth shall be far richer than them all. Yeah. Okay. So if you're going to connect the M three plus the fourth to Leah's sons, okay, you have. Um, oh. Reuben being Clinton, Simeon 
would line up with Bush too, Obama with Levi, Trump with um, Judah, and then so Biden would be Issachar. Okay. So, so you have that number from Issachar connecting your to the presidential. Yeah. So the next seven, seven. is Issachar after, after Judah. That's all you're saying with Issachar. Yes. Okay. So in a sense that it would maybe connect Biden to Issachar. Okay. So there, you, therefore, you have October 22nd. You have that number for Issachar connecting to the actual victory of Biden in the presidential election. Okay. Well, that's good. Okay. Yeah. So I had already um, had made an application with Issachar, but not with the six, 64,300. So I hadn't used that calculation. I'd use the other one. So that's interesting. I, I, I need to look at that again in a bit more detail. Okay. Um, Can I ask a question? Yeah. What is the, what is the, um, what connects Biden with Ishikar? So, Ishikar. So I'll explain it again. So what we have is we have the sons of Leah. And if you take the sons of Leah, we're going to have Judah representing Trump. So the next son of Leah is going to be Issachar. And then we can count from October 22nd, 1844, to the date that Biden was declared uh, president. That is the November uh, 7th date there in 2020. And I think it was the last time I was at Collins Studies, uh, because I know I was driving from Collins uh, that evening. We were there fairly late, and uh, Heidi and I were listening to uh, the celebrations on the streets uh, of New York and every other place in the United States. Um, if because uh, that's uh, that's the day the celebrations happened, right? That Saturday. Yeah. Yeah, so, so, I, so I have a, a memory of it when it occurred. Uh, but so that's taking the number of the tribe of Issachar, the second counting of Issachar, not the one in, in uh, Numbers 2, but the one in Numbers 26, and using it as a period of days and linking it to Biden's uh, victory. So, so I think that's pretty significant to take October 22nd and count that number of days. I agree. Um, yeah, so... So, and this is the thing about the. Thank you. I just, I just wanted to know what, um, what the connection was. Yeah, yeah. So, so this is the thing that's interesting is we, I've been looking at the numbering of the tribes of Israel, and, you know, trying to make all of these connections. But there's more than I can do. I mean, there's, there's lots of possibilities. But Stephen isn't just, you know, counted from something and given another event. He's actually had a reason why he could do that, right? That de dealing with the sons of, of Leah. Okay. Uh, yep. Yeah. Now, if we're applying Trump to Judah, does that also not mean that we should be applying the banner of Judah to Trump? The lion? Yes. And then the banner of Issachar to Biden. Okay. And the banner of Issachar is? A strong boned donkey, an ass. Um, okay. Genesis 49, 14 to 15. And what does an ass symbolize? Islam. And what else? Democrats. Once again, Dwight, you 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 um you put it right to the point. <laughs> Just another point is that Issachar, I think it's connected to a man of hire. Uh, I think it was um, one of the words that uh, Leah gave. It was concerning um, 
hiring mandrakes or something. It was, there's a story there where Ruben collects these mandrakes right. and Rachel asks for them. And okay. um, Leah sort of complains and then sort of they get to that she has Jacob that evening and uh, she conceives. And then, so this year, as a car is like a man of hire to me, and to me, that would seem to connect with Biden in a sense that Biden is just like a, a man of hire in a sense. He's like a puppet. Right. Just, uh, um, just doing what he's told. You know, you have all these here speeches. He has to have nothing spontaneous. They have to be all written down answers. So it's, um, he's just sort of going through the motions, I think. You know, as a, so the new, uh, as a name, that would sort of connect with him. Yeah, I mean, even the directions that are given to him, because he, he showed one of his cards, and of course they could zoom in on it. And and like every step of what he has to do is written down on that card. He just has to follow directions. He can't even go up to the podium, and he doesn't even know how to do that without a direction card. Well, if we, if, if we take a look at the blessing that Jacob gave to his sons, mm -hmm. I'm looking specifically at the blessing given to Issachar that we find in Genesis 49, 14, and 15. Okay. Issachar is a strong ass couching down between two burdens. He saw that rest was good and that the land, that it was pleasant, and bowed his shoulder to bear and became a servant unto tribute which means that he's basically sold into captivity. Right. So doesn't this relate right back to what we're talking about, about captivity captive? Yeah. Yes. What was that? Uh, what was that Where quote? Genesis 49, 14 to 15. 49, 14 to 15. Right. Well, wouldn't you also consider that you did the first part of that, when where you're talking about couch between he couch between two couches, I think it was two burdens. Two burdens. Wouldn't that stand for being like work, like you hard work? Um. Well, if he's couching down, okay. it's like his all of his legs are folded. He's in recline. Okay. Okay. He's fallen down. Yeah. And, and it's not so much, I mean, it's kind of hard to understand sometimes uh, when you have a preposition like the word between, but basically he has a double burden upon him that's, that's, he's not able to bear is the idea. It's not so but, much between <laughs> the burdens, even though that word can often be, uh, but it could be up on him as well. Where so his burdens were doubled? Yeah, that's what the two burdens is. It's a doubled burden because it's he's written. Kind of, he's like between the Pope and China, the UN and China, or well, China's part of big major part of the UN, but that's what I'm figuring. I'm, yeah. I'm not yeah, looking at it that way. way. Yeah. It's in the dual okay. form. So it, it's a dual form. That's why it, the word two isn't there. But the the form of the word, the word burdens there, is in a, like it's the word mishpa. Um, and it's just written in a dual form. So that means it's two. Okay. For our time, rather than trying to involve China, is this the the, the two burdens is this not papalism and spiritualism? Yes, this is not China. This is papalism not is spiritualism deluxe. Yeah. So this this has to be the um, so so I would say that he's he's caught between these different powers. So you have the United States, you have spiritualism, and I think you have the papacy. Well, the, I mean the the whole point is that we have the beast, the dragon, and the false prophet. Right. Yeah. Okay. Now, the thing that I'm looking at as well, 
if we have a strong ass that has fallen down. Yeah. Where else in the Bible do we find an ass that has fallen down? The fellow that um, wanted to do the curses, right? Right. I can't remember his name. Balaam? Right. Yeah. So we know that Islam is represented by the ass. Islam falling with Issachar, Islam falling under Balaam, it's still a message. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's some form, but it is so a message. When, when we're looking at it in this way, we have Trump being represented by the Lion of Judah. We have Biden now represented by the ass of Issachar mm -hmm. under a double burden. So and he's going to take rest. He's going to he's gonna not really bear it because when it says he bowed his shoulder to bear, right? Uh, it doesn't. That means he basically. Um, bent away from bearing right so what would be bearing he's not and then he becomes a servant under tribute so basically he just sells himself um he's selling himself to the the green ideas mm -hmm. but it's also interesting because looking at that word for tribute Mm -hmm. It occurs 23 times in the Bible, but it's properly a burden as in causing to faint or that is a tax in the form of forced labor. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Which could make sense. This guy is a fiat guy. So what's forced labor? Slavery. Thank you. Labor, slavery. What was that? Slavery. Slavery. Okay. Slavery, yeah. Slavery, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so one of the things we see here, so when we're looking at these tribes, we also look at what they symbolize, not just the enumeration of them, just the number. And, and we did this already with, with the other tribes when we were looking at their spans, taking their numbers as days. So, um, so this is consistent with what we've been doing. Now, again, I just want to point out that, you know, this is rather um, unusual what we're doing in some ways, how we're, we're looking at this. But, but we were put into this situation, you know, first because of Odilia's study. But right. That this, this is confirmed. And, and these spans of time, these numbers can refer to spans of time. Now, I don't think we're going to get this all sorted out today as far as what we're seeing here in Judges. Um, but, um, you know, so these are, are really good things that we're going to have to look at. We're going to have to revisit these after we've spent a bit of time on this. But uh, I want to look here then at what we see happening as far as so we got to up to Issachar um so the princes of Issachar were with Deborah even Issachar right so why is there this doubling of Issachar does that have something to relate to the two burdens or is that just a a recognition that there's something further to go along with this occur. Yeah, so so we would see that the the these deals with the midnight cry. And okay. now remember, we had placed Raphia as January 6th. And that's going to be this defeat of the king of the north by the king of the south, right? That's, right. that's the battle of Raphia. And then we're looking at this midterm as Paneum. 
right? Which is the midnight cry. So we've got midnight and the midnight cry. So Biden's at both of those places because he's the king of the south. But he's going to be defeated uh, by the king of the north. Right? That's what we understand. That's how we're applying it right now. Correct? Yes. Okay. Now, of course, how we interpret what that defeat is and what it's going to look like, there's differences within the movement regarding that. So some take it that Trump's going to become president again, where I don't see that that's what's being described. But it's not consistent with all of the symbols. Okay. Are we applying Biden as the king of the South? Or Putin? The Democrats. The Democrats. Right. So Biden just happens to be uh, the figurehead for the Democrats. So this isn't really referring to Biden himself personally. It's referring to the Democrats as a symbol. Right. And we know that from, from the Civil War in, 18, in the 1860s, where the North was the Republicans and the South, the South was the Democrats. Correct? Right. Correct. But, we're still seeing that application within the United States here. Uh, but we also see that there are, are different powers being represented. Um, so, you know, we looked at some of that when we were dealing with uh, the presidents of the United States. So we're, we're addressing that point here. So Stephen's point is well taken. I mean, we can see that this is fits in with what we already understand about what happened in connection with Biden, Biden's election. And then we have here, um, and also Barack. So Barack is mentioned, Ruth, Deborah, even Issachar, and also Barack. So that means Deborah had some of these, the princes of Issachar, and also Barack had some. So what that means specifically, I don't know, but that's what it says. And he was sent on foot into the valley, talking, referring to Barack. For the divisions of Reuben, there were great thoughts of heart. Now, again, we have a mathematical term, a division of Reuben. Um, and and what's, this, what's the point of Reuben? Because we had Reuben re representing uh, Parminder. Which I think is a good application because the blessing that was given to Reuben was that he was as unstable as water. And that aptly describes Parminder. Yeah. So if we look at the divisions of Reuben here, this would represent people who were following Parminder's message. Right. Okay. And there were great thoughts of heart. So the word great here is gadol, which is the, means to exalt, right? Right. Um, thoughts here refer can refer to uh, resolution, decree, thought, and enactment, and that comes from a word that uh, means to hack, that is to engrave, to be a scribe, uh, by implication to enact. Right. Laws being cut in a stone or metal tablets or primitive in primitive times. So it's a, a very descriptive way to describe. A law, but then you have um, so great thoughts of heart, and then when you read in the next verse, it says, "Why abodest thou among the sheepfolds to hear the bleedings of the flocks? For the divisions of Reuben, there were great searchings of heart." Now this is not the same. The word heart is the same, and gadol is the same, but now it's not going to use uh, the word that means like engravings. But it's going to use the word that means an examination or finding out the number of something. So the searchings of heart is to find out the number of, of this. So can we see that maybe within Reuben that there are two different groups? I wouldn't disagree with well, that. Yeah. Yeah, it says divisions for the divisions of Reuben. So there's more than one group. It says yeah. divisions. Yeah, so at least two. At least two. Right. So, so we can see that from Parminder's rebellion, people who were following that message, 
There are some that are going to exalt themselves in their own laws, right? And then you're going to have another group that's going to uh, search out or enumerate um, the chronology, right? So you're going to have that some. That sounds feasible. So, I mean, that's a possibility. And then you're going to have Gilead abode beyond Jordan. And why did Dan remain in ships? Asher continued on the seashore and abode in his breaches. Zebulun and Naphtali were a people that jeopardized their lives unto the death in the high places of the field. Okay, but step back for just a second. Mm -hmm. Question from the chat. And also Barak, he was sent on foot into the valley. Why is that important that we should know this now? Okay. I'm sorry. The reason I put that in there is oftentimes we, we kind of pass over stuff. Right. And it, it just seems so inconsequential at the moment. And this is one of those things. Uh, the foot, you know, um, uh, resonated with me for whatever reason. Uh, and that's why I posed the question. Okay. Uh, okay. The foot. Now, what do we associate the foot with? <laughs> well, I don't think that that's relevant here. Um, okay. So, I, I'm just, I, you know, yeah. we pass over stuff before yeah. and end up coming back to it and going, oh, we missed that. Yeah, but so I I'm, I'm just trying to put that stuff in out there. Yeah. So when we have here Barak, because this is going to be the message of chronology. And how was the message of chronology treated by the movement? Well, it was trampled underfoot. Yeah. And it was also cast out. Yes, it was. Right. So. So this is what I would look at and because the valley here, this is where they're going to have this this battle. Okay, it begins to make sense now. Yeah, and sent means to push away, which is one of the means or to cast away. Right to send away. So this is what what happened in this movement regarding chronology. Um, so. So that's the way that I would apply it. Um, and so then we go through all these different things. So we're going to have the divisions of Reuben in these two different references to the divisions of Reuben. And then we're going to have, now Gilead abode beyond the Jordan. And why did Dan remain in ships? So why is this Gilead uh referenced here because who's in gilead that's on the on the the east side jordan right niger w what did you say stephen was elijah from gilead okay but yeah but which tribe What tribes, you know, um, and why did Dan remain in ships? So we have, who do we have on in, in the land of Gilead? Do you remember which tribes were there? What, wasn't it a half tribe of Manasseh? We have a half tribe of Manasseh. So that's one there. We have Gad, uh, which is, well, still south of that, but still on that side of the Jordan. And, right. and, and Reuben. Reuben. And Reuben. and Reuben. Okay. So, and and then where was Dan? Why did Dan remain in ships? Especially, on the seashore in a boat in his beaches. Especially, isn't isn't this word that's translated ships in the feminine rather than the masculine? Um. Yeah. Well, let me see here. It's possible. So wasn't Dan the tribe that um, 
took some other land from other people, but they, they was on the coast, weren't they? They were originally on the coast and then they went up to conquer part of a, of a uh, portion of another tribe's allotment, yes. Right. Is there any significance in that? Because he was on the coast. Right. That would put him in ships at times, you know, because of it being a, you're on a coast, fisherman. I mean, it would make sense to ships me anyway. Could be, <clears throat> ships Real estate was trading a thing right from <clears throat> What was that, Angela? <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> ships could mean trading too, even from afar, back and forth. Yeah, we have the ships of Tarsius, right? Yeah, it is. Yeah. A, um, yeah. It's the feminine plural here, oat at the end. Yeah. So if Dan is remaining in the feminine form of the ships, what can we derive from this? I mean, I, I look at ships. <clears throat> And I think of implements of war. But if you're looking at ships in the feminine, like was just being addressed, is this not something having to deal with commerce? It seems so. Yeah. Yeah, it would refer to, to commerce. Well, then that could take us to Revelation 18, the merchants standing afar and all the ships out with all their cargo. Now, Asher continued on the seashore. And there you just see um, why, why the seashore. Not, an abode in his breaches. That is um, the, the breaking of the waves on the shore. But it can refer to a haven. Wouldn't, this, wouldn't it um, see, see be people? Is he um, continually in the people? Well, it can, but it, I, I don't know if we would use it. On the sea, I mean, on the people. I'm sorry. Yeah, but this is the seashore and abode in breaches. The idea is uh, to be protected from the waves of the sea. A, a harbor, in a sense, a yeah. safe harbor. Yeah. And if, if, you, if you look through the history, um, that is how a lot of the countries came together is through commerce, uh, and the sea played a mighty role in that. Okay. So Zebulun and Naphtali were a people that jeopardized their lives unto death in the high places of the field. Right. So, so here, these are the tribes we have mentioned, uh, we have Ephraim, Benjamin, the half-tribe of Manasseh on the west side, Jordan, Macher, Zebulun, Issachar, Reuben, uh, Dan, and Asher, and, and also um, Naphtali. So we've got 10 of the tribes mentioned, or eight of the tribe, nine of the tribes mentioned. Uh, so which tribes aren't mentioned? Levi, of course. Well, Levi wouldn't be counted as one of the 12 tribes, but. Yeah, so you're not going to have Judah mentioned. Right. Did you, you don't have Manasseh. Yeah. You don't have Manasseh, do you? Yeah, yeah. we do. Yeah. Uh, Simeon's not mentioned. And Gad is not mentioned, unless it's sort of included um, in uh, the reference to Gilead, but I don't think so. I would think that would refer to the other half tribe of Manasseh. So you don't have Gad, uh, Judah, 
or sin mentioned. Interesting. Because if Simeon, <clears throat> Judah, and Gad are not mentioned. Yeah. In birth order, you would have sons number two, four, and six. Yeah. But you're also... You've that'd got, two, wouldn't that be two, four, and seven? Gad the seventh? I'm showing it in birth order, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Naphtali, and Gad. Okay, you left Dan out there. <clears throat> okay, you're right, because I, I was counting the 144,000, so you, right. you're right. Okay, so that's why. Okay. And... So anyway, we, we, we're not settled on what this all means as far as numbers, but I would argue that there is some kind of calculation that we could do here, that we need to look at these in some kind of a structure that relates to our time. Whatever that means, I don't know. Um, but that's my suggestion. And so it's going to be something we're going to have to look at. Now, I do want to address another point here. So... The other thing that we had a discussion about was uh, dealing with the birth of Samuel Snow. When was he born? So Dwight, can you just give us a little bit of background on that? So this is this is going to relate to what we're doing here, but but it's it's uh, we need to get the background first. Okay. Well, <clears throat> well, I'll, I'll let you share your um, your diag. You don't I, got I, it. You I don't share? have it on this computer. Okay, I can share it then. That's fine. Um, okay, so where did I put that? But you, you can tell us a bit about this, what this is. Okay. Basically, Theodore had made the comment the other day that it'd be nice to know when Samuel Snow was born. Now, from find a grave, we were able to determine his date of death as being the 28th of July of 1890. Using a membership that I have, be, thanks to my cousin, who is a member of the Mormon Church, I went into that membership and did some research on Samuel Snow. Now, you're not able to initially find much on Snow, but there is quite a bit of information regarding his son, Theodore. Theodore was born July 18th of 1848. And, that, and uh, this, this is 1,365 days after October 22nd. Okay. And, and, and the significance of the th 1365 is from Numbers chapter three, where they uh, redeem the firstborn, the Levites. Um, so the redemption of the firstborn has to do with the, um, uh, the pain of these shekels. So it's 1365 shekels, which we're gonna take as days. So I, th I think that's kind of significant in the context here. It's also interesting, I believe, that that passage says that those shekels are the shekel of the sanctuary. Right. So to me... So them from October 22nd, 1844 makes sense. Right. And I had calculated this prior to knowing anything about Samuel's uh, Sheffield's snow or son Theodore, um, because I had the date July 18th as being 1,365 shekels 
from October 22nd, but I didn't really have an event in 1848 to, to give that any significance other than the symbolic date of July 18th. So now we have an actual event. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Now, <clears throat> biblically, if we look at, at Snow's birthday, we're looking at the 25th day of the fifth month of 1806. On the, on the biblical calendar. On the biblical calendar. Now, as we were as we were going through some of these things, there seemed to be quite a bit interrelated with snow with different portions that we have been studying that interrelate with things that have to do with the United States. The fact that snow served in the U.S. Marine Corps was for me interesting. Now, in the different databases, his wife's name is listed in different ways. But on the death certificate for their son, it pointed to the fact that her name would be Elvira Minerva Snow. So there was, there's quite a bit that was there. Now, Iran did quite a bit of work to, to come up with some other items on this as well. Mm -hmm. So in looking at things with this, with, with Samuel Snow, we also were addressing that he was born in New Haven, Connecticut. He was married on the 27th of November of 1832, which means that they had basically about a nine month courtship, he and his wife, from the time that he left the Marine Corps. Now, uh, just getting back to is September 10th, as you said, it's the 25th day of the fifth month. So that's a symbol right. of 525. It's a, uh, you dropped out there for a second. 525. So okay. you get the division of the 777 structure. Right. 252 and 525. So. I'm pulling up another document right now, so bear with me for just a moment. But it was interesting to see the number of days of the life of Samuel Snow and how some of these things interrelated with other points that we've been looking at. So, I always hate it when my computers are slow. Yeah. So so when he dies, July 28th, 1890. Now, it's one day after July 27th, and it's one day after the 10th day of the fifth month, which is rather interesting. And notice his birth is one day before September 11th. Right. So there's kind of this symmetry in that he's born, born after or, or he's born before, pardon me, before um, a significant symbolic date. And he dies one day after two symbolic dates. So okay, that, so if, if we look at this also using symbolism, mm -hmm. okay. And here again, this is the work that Iran, that Iran did. Assuming that this is correct, Snow lived for 30,637 days. 
Yeah. If we if we treat this as prophetic periods, it would take us to the 1022nd month. So 1022. Symbolizing October 22nd. That would be 83 years and 321 days Gregorian. If you treat 321 as prophetic months, it would be 10.7 months, 10th day of the seventh month. The 321st day of the year is November 17th, if it's not a leap year. You could look at this as 85 prophetic years plus 37 days. The 37th day of the year is February 6th. My birthday. We also have 321 as a symbol for the Sunday law of 321 AD. So there is just a little bit that we're seeing here. Yeah. Yeah, that speaks volumes already. Mm hmm. Yeah, and even 1806, that's 186, the number of days cardinally from the first day of the first month to the 10th day of the seventh month. But, you know, these are just little details. I mean, there are some broader uh, things here. But as we're also looking at this, snow came out of the Marine Corps just before his 26th birthday okay so that's when he he finishes serving correct I don't know when he began to serve that's that was one of the reasons why i want to go into another database and see what can be determined yeah does either he either served for two years or he served for four years okay but you would also have specific dates is, is it always to the day or? are we actually talking about a father samuel or son snow. samuel snow we're talking about the father, Samuel Snow himself. He served in the Marine Corps? Yes, sir. Interesting. I thought it was the son and didn't think about it too much. No, because, I mean, if he, if he came out of the Corps February 24th of 1832, that would have been just about 16 years before his son was born. And that's why it was striking me that he had a, a fairly short courtship with his wife, because if he was married November 27th of 1832, it means that they had just this number of days before they entered into a covenant relationship. So there's a whole bunch of symbolism here relating to Samuel Snow with different things that we've been seeing that interrelate here with the movement. Yes, I, I would agree. What were you reading from earlier there? I seen you looking over and reading something and uh, coming up with some dates that I didn't see. Uh, time, dates, that kind of stuff that I don't see in this one that Theodore has uh, popped up here? It's a, it was an email that Iran sent to me. And it was details that he had put together. Mm. So I'll see what can be done to copy some of this off so it can go out to everybody. Yeah, it would be nice to see, actually kind of see this on a line, wouldn't you think? Yeah. It, it was interesting to go into this because, and I agree with your point, it would be nice to see this on the line. When Theodore made the comment during the study yesterday that it would be nice to understand this about Samuel Snow, there was quite a bit that came up in trying to find this. Mm. And 
it was only because of finding the death certificate of his son that so many of these other details came to light. So now they become relevant. Um, right. On what? Because, you know, all this stuff, you know, theater said that you all of a sudden come across this and uh, here we go with Providence again. Yeah. So, so we have all this information that we still have to sort through. But every time yes. we start looking at things, we get more information we have to sort through. Yes. And so, but they do all eventually come together. Um, well, so we were talking earlier, Theodore, I think it was before a meeting, and we were discussing the, uh, the NOPS on the uh, menorah. Yeah. Um, I, I'm thinking that all that stuff is becoming relevant in the, uh, 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 with a need to know. <laughs> well, yeah, that's an analytical tool that we can look at. But yes, yeah. it seems to be that he put it there for a reason. <laughs> I'm just saying, you know, uh, the priority wouldn't wouldn't it be to be getting to uh, that tool that we can actually use? So within, yeah, but we well, need to figure out that tool. We need to make that tool, or it's already made. We need to figure out, you know, what well, it does. Well, I already understand what it does because it sorts out the lines. Yes, okay. and it gives us the levels of the lines, but. But it's not going to apply right here yet, because you know what we what we have here is some information that we're sorting out, and and it will come on the lines eventually. Yes. So, uh, so. one of the comments from the chat is that November twenty seventh, eleven twenty seven, was also part of the July eighteenth, twenty twenty date. Can you? Oh, okay. That was the Islamic date, eleven twenty. Okay. Right. Okay. Um, yeah. So, so we have this with Samuel Snow. We have he served in the Marine Corps, so we don't know when he began. Um, and then, of course, to me, the significant thing is seeing his son Theodore, because uh, it's the same name I have. And, and he keeps his middle name. Um, so he, his son gets the middle name of, of his father. And then, of course, July 18th. Because if we were going to pick a significant date for a son of Samuel Snow that's named Theodore, um, the only two dates that I would really consider sig really significant is if it was February 6th or July 18th. Um, we have other dates, but they would not be as significant as July 18. It, it makes about sense. the August 13th. Yeah, well, that there too. So you have August 13th, the symbol of Palmoni. So we've already dealt with that date. Um, as well but it's it's just you know first the birthdays because that's what we're we're addressing here and so the end and the beginning of theodore sheffield snow has these two very significant dates one representing palmoni um but the most the if you're going to associate a date with me um the most significant date would be the july 18th prediction right yes right so so the fact that Samuel Snow has the son Theodore, um, I think is pretty significant as a symbol. I would have to agree, but you know we're going to get a lot of flack for this. Well, okay. well, I didn't name his son Theodore. I get it. I mean, I get it. <laughs> it's just a you know people's minds wander in that direction. But okay, but symbol, well, right? one of the other comments in the chat: nineteen sixteen divide by thirty is 63 remainder 26 or 1963 february 20 february 6th yeah, which is my birthday so if we take the date uh or the year that um theodore snow dies 1916 and we just divide it by a prophetic month we come up with my birthday so which is rather interesting uh, this is just more evidence. Yeah. 
Now, again, you know, we have to be very clear. This is all symbols dealing with messages. That's right. Symbols attached to these messages. So, you know, it doesn't make me a prophet or anything like that. I, I get it. I get it. But not everybody will. Yeah. Some people are going to take that sort of significance there. And, and, and because we have people having dates attached to them who are, you know, who are on the wrong side of the issue. Yes. Right? Part of the structure, you know. One of the most significant ones, which I find interesting, has to do, and I've mentioned this many times, but you know, when we, when, when I calculated the three ninety one point five from October thirteenth to November 9th, um, it's quite interesting that we have a person who's born on November 9th and a person who's born on October thirteenth that are tied together, and that is Tess and AOC, right? AOC is born October 13th, 1989, at noon. And Tess is born 391.5 days later, on November 9th. Right, so for taking the noon symbol, right, for October 13th, uh, AOC is born in New York at noon, during the noon hour. Not exactly right dead on at noon, but a little bit after, like 12 minutes or something. Um, but anyway, you can see the symbolism there uh, with, now we're not going to say AOC and Tess are prophets. They can be false prophets. Right. Well, they can be false prophets. And, and we know that that can be true of any person just because they have a date or a number or a symbol attached to them. Uh, just like we have Emiliano, his birthday is July 21st, 1976. And he's the one who came up with understanding, uh, the initial understanding of uh, Ezra 7-9, which is going to lead us to the understanding of the Midnight Cry, which ultimately is going to lead to the understanding of July 21st as midnight. But, right. but you know, we're not looking to Emiliano for light because we look to God's word for light. Right. No person is put in the place of God or is an authority that has to be heeded, that has to be listened to just because there are some symbols connected with them. So um, as I was speaking with somebody yesterday, it came to my mind that um, we were, uh, I'm sorry, Snow, the, the person of interest at this point, or the principal at this point, mm -hmm. um, his his thing was was that he thought he was this the prophet Elijah Elijah that's right and uh, what we have noticed is, is that it's not and this is probably what could have happened earlier I mean if we think about this if he would have if he would have uh, seen that and as the the movement being the prophet I think this would all happen the way it should have happened in the first place, but now we're repeating it. And so we have now seen that um, it's not any one individual. It is the, the movement that is the actual prophet. Um, my point to all that was, is we corrected a mistake that was made on early by Snow. Yeah, and we're not going to make that same mistake. No, sir. Right, so... Um, and, and the thing about Snow is he, he, he predicted himself as a prophet. That is, he hints at it even earlier on in 1842 or 1843, I think, in one of his articles, that there's going to be this prophet who's going to come. So, so he sees himself as that prophet. So right through that whole period of time, and I, I think since it parallels the movement, we can see that the movement – has has acted like snow in a lot of ways right and has gone astray that is uh, you concerned you mean like jeff being the prophet is that what you're well i'm also saying to ffa believing it had the authority to uh censure those that disagreed with it uh, yeah i went over that how i got ejected and that was over that uh documentation or I'm sorry, 
um, that thing that they wrote out, because I was ejected on uh, 1231. Um, and it was over that particular document that, and what you had said about it. And I was agreeing with you. And that's when I was ejected. Yeah. So the December, the December uh, 6th, 2020 declaration. So yes. You, the December 6th declaration. WhatsApp on the 31st. Yeah, I got, yeah, I got ejected out the 31st and that was, uh, um, after listening to him whining, I mean, I swear, I, I, I kept going, you know, I was expecting a little bit more from the FFA movement than just, you know, looking for Jeff when he has told them over and over again, you know, it's the end of me. <laughs> and I, 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 I said a couple, I, uh, I put in three or four messages, but it was basically, you know, we don't need Jeff to figure this out. You know, uh, we, we just need to do it. Yeah. And that's, and that's what God is showing that, you know, he can lead his people, this movement to understand truth. And no one has, you know, a hundred percent complete, complete understanding, correct understanding of everything. God isn't leading an individual that other people are then going to follow. He's leading a movement. And it's difficult. I mean, it'd be much easier, uh, you know, just to have a leader who tells us what to do, right? But well, that's, that's what every want, everybody wants. To, that's to height the blaziness, though. Yeah. Uh, you know, we, we don't want to have to figure all that stuff because it's, too, it's, it's taxing. I mean, come on. Yeah, well, I do it all the time. You know, I'm not that I do it. I shook it off, but I, I have to do all those things right. because I'm the only one there to do it, you know? <laughs> so anyway, what we see here, so our time, we went a bit over time, but what we understand is that we can look at these sections here. We can see that we have time is connected to this movement, which we already understand. And that um, we can look at this past history in Millerite history and see these spans of time and see these symbolic dates. And what we're going to do is we're going to try to bring this all together because we can attach some of these periods of time that we see with these tribes to these different dates that we are given. Birthdays is one. Uh, fulfillments of prophecy or waymarks are another. Agreeable. And even the death of a person. Right? Agreeable. So we did it with the Pope. We did it with Pius the sixth. Yeah, there's precedence for all this. Right. So we should be able to look at all of these periods of times that are given us in the symbols of the numbering of the tribes of Israel. And we should be able to uh, have a um, derive some kind of formula from this section in in um, Judges chapter five. That is my understanding when we're looking at Judges chapter five is it's telling us how to do a calculator. It's giving us a formula um, to do some kind of calculation. That's what I think it's doing, but I'm not sure how to construct the formula. You know, but as I said, you got like out of Ephraim, there was a root, is that a square root? Are we taking this and subtracting it out of the tribe of Ephraim? And then, you know, then we're going to have Benjamin. Are we going to like add Benjamin then to, to this number? And out of, of Macher, which is Manasseh, are we going to take that out? Right? Are, are we going to have some kind of calculation? I mean, maybe there's something there. I don't know. Um, are we going to look at the divisions of Reuben? Are we just going to cut the number of Reubens in half? If we take Reuben and cut it in half, does that give us a a number, which is a number of days that we can fit into these lines? Because we've already used Reuben, right? We've already used Issachar, and we have another use of Issachar. We've already used Zebulun, because that's the one that Odilio used. And then I've also used Naphtali as a span of time. So these are going to connect us to uh, these histories in the past, in either Millerite history or Adventist history, 
to events in our history. It seems on the surface like a rather ridiculous idea that we can do this. But the thing is, we can do it. We've been doing it. And, and I think we would have to complete that. It doesn't make sense to just take a few of these tribes and have a few connections. It seems that we should be able to take all of these tribes, there's nine of them here, uh, that we can use in these calculations. What you propose is completely logical from my perspective as to what we've been learning. Yeah, right, it's logical, but just crazy, right? Well, yeah. <laughs> right, so, but, but I understand the logic of it. And, and the thing is, if we can do it, if we can complete the picture, um, that's much more uh, convincing than just taking a few spans of time and connecting them to some events. Because one of the things that's clear to me is when I look at the Protestants who counterfeit this movement, right, because the counterfeit comes before the genuine, and they will take spans of time in Jewish history and they'll connect them numerically to span to, or not spans of times, but events in Jewish history in the past and connect them to events in modern Jewish history. And, and these are sort of tenuous connections. They're quite complex calculations. They have to have this sort of fudge factor in how they do things to arrive at their dates. And, you know, that's not something that I think I want to do. I don't want to have something that's just subjective. I want to see something that's objective. That yes. is, is not just derived from some kind of, you know, because once you get a lot of dates and once you get a lot of spans, I mean, a person can argue, well, you're going to find connections here or there. But if you're going to find connections everywhere with all of them, then that becomes rather impossible. You know, like one little interesting statistically detail. improbable. Yeah. So one little interesting detail. So if you go from uh, the date July 21st, for instance, so that's midnight. And um, you're going to, uh, let me see, where did I do this before? Um, and you're going to count, um, where's the number here? I'm trying to remember what I did. Um, that's why I'm looking at the wrong place. Okay, so you're going to count uh, 18720 from July 21st. Now, it doesn't happen for every year. So here, I'm just going to switch this. I'm sorry we're going a bit late, but I just want to finish this idea. So we already have the symbol of a, of a span of time as being 18720. That is, it's 52 years less 273 days. Now, if I go to 1844, for instance, and I put in July 21st, and I count 18720 days, I'm going to come to October 22nd, 1895. So one thing we can see about this number, 18720, is it connects midnight, which is the center of this 187 days from the first day of the first month to the 10th day of the seventh month in 1844. And it connects us to October 22 in another year, you know, 50, 51 years and and however many 504 days later no, it wouldn't be that way it'd be like whatever the number is left over the years so it's 273 days less than 52 years it that is it's 52 prophetic years is that significant would we just say well that's arbitrary it's just chance that we can take midnight boston 1844 Instead of just counting the 94 days to October 22nd, or the 93 days, I guess it is, to October 22nd, 
we can actually count and come to that same date with our July 18, 2020 symbol, right? So, so to answer your question, I would say no. There's, it's it's uh, not just you know a coincidence. Right. So it's not just a coincidence. Now, you know, nothing happens on October 20, 22, 1895, uh, but maybe something does. I don't that know. we know of. Right. But but that doesn't necessarily matter because symbolically we can connect these. So some of these spans of time may connect with events that actually occur on symbolic dates, but some of them may not. And, you know, what we could do is, you know, we could go to 1844 and we could count back, you know, 18720 days as well. And we're going to come to July 21st, 1793. And, and July 21st, 1793, well, that actually is a significant date. Does anybody know what happened on that date? where that came showed up before I just thought of doing it now so it's not the end of terror okay it's yeah so it's during um this uh this history in France and I'd have to I can't remember exactly what the event is but I'm pretty sure I had that on my line I'm trying to find it here on my it's hard to search for July 21st because we have it marked so many places was that the date for um <laughs> that goddess of whatever her name was that they paraded her around um i don't know i don't think that's what it was for i'm just guessing here because uh, i don't remember the date i'm just thinking of the significant things that happened pre-1798 just uh, another interesting idea yeah. From October 22nd, 1844, it is then 18 months, sorry, 18 years, seven months, and two days until uh, May 23rd, 1863. Okay. So, <laughs> they, when, okay. You just found that now, Stephen? Yes. Okay. So, so there you have another way we can use that symbol. Um, so that, so these are, you know, you need to make a note of these things, Stephen. Don't forget about it. Please. Uh, and we do have July 21st, uh, 1773, which is the Jesuit order, um, is uh, um, banned, right? Um, and then you have, oh, there's a whole bunch of other things I forgot about. But, yeah, I can't remember specifically uh where we would place this what this was but there's some event i believe on that date I, I mean i could be wrong but we also have other july 21sts and spans of time that that i notice like for instance july 21st when the jesuit order is banned and you have the battle of manassas and that's actually a prophetic uh it's going to be 88 years and um so Anyway, I know we went way over time. So let's close with a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are so thankful for the light that you are giving us. Help us to take the time to sort through it and to understand it. Uh, be with us throughout this day. Bring us together again according to thy will. And we pray that you can bless each person. Help us to understand these things. All of this information can be overwhelming and we need your guidance. Help us to sort through it so that we can present it simply in a convincing manner to those who are inquiring. Thank you for hearing our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.